Andy Sullivan is our neighborhood prosecutor for the city attorney's office. After that, we're going to have uh, Aaron Seinfeld and then uh, Barry. Um, so come on up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? I was worried that there's no microphone, then I realized that I've been in trial before, so I'm okay with that. Um, if you all don't know who I am, my name is Andy Solomon. I am the neighborhood prosecutor for Van Nuys and Sherman Oaks. That means I deal with a lot of the things that regular prosecution or regular government intervention don't typically solve. Um, as our senior leads told us, the community really is an integral part of keeping your community safe. Things that you guys tell us, whether anonymously or not, can lead to big things. So um, we always encourage you guys to reach out to us, whether you can reach out to me directly, you can reach out to your senior leads, whoever you reach out to in this team, and you're part of this team, we will figure out the resources that we need to allocate to try to resolve issues. Uh, one thing, oh, two things I'll say. The first is that I'm sure you guys heard that we have a new city attorney. Um, who hasn't heard that? I, I'm pretty sure you all heard that. I'm very excited to work with her. I think she's visiting you guys soon. I'm not going to give away the spoiler, but you guys got to keep tuning into the uh, the newsletters and everything to know when she's coming. But she's coming soon, and I'm excited for you guys to see her. I think you guys already may know. Some of you may know her already. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that an update on a case you may have seen in the, in the news where a local business owner had uh, feces thrown at him in his mm -hmm. car. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that, I'm handling that case. Uh, months ago, we sent it to mental health court. We did a lot of work on it. Another neighborhood prosecutor night, because he has an issue in West LA as well, uh, we were teaming up on it. It's still in mental health court. The update will be, I, I'm trying, we're trying to get him into a program so that he doesn't stay in limbo forever, right? <laughs> Uh, the hope is that by February 10th, we have another court date to check in and see what the status is with that. So February, I'll let you know what's going on. So stay tuned. I know it's like one of those lazy cliffhangers on those shows, but hey, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, so if you need to reach me, um, just find me and I'll give you my email address. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you Andy. Much. Aaron. Come on, you're up next. And then Barry after that. And then Ryan after that. You guys can come around this way. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Erin Seinfeld. She's with Karen Bass's office. She's our Valley rep. So if you have any issues, right? Yeah. I, I, she, she's our Valley mayor. So <laughs> the buck stops with this girl in the Valley. So if you have any issues that you want to get to Karen, just talk to her. We, I thought we had him there. Well, we have an honorary mayor. You're, you're half right. Um, no, it's really nice to see a lot of people in person. Um, I am going to be so brief, but if you want to talk further, just reach out. Emails in the city are kind of easy, and by last name, most people know it as well. It's Aaron.Seinfeld. Um, for Gen Zers, you may have to explain the spelling. Um, so Mayor Bass has been off to an incredible start, and I think that most people have seen that within the first month, she declared a state of emergency, she's put two executive directives together, the first one to, was to accelerate the housing production, um, and the second one is called Inside Safe, which you may have seen, the city's approach to assist with individuals at encampments. Um, we have done two, uh, nearly 100 people were moved into housing in Venice. It was, uh, for those that don't know, it was an incredibly well-known historic encampment, so it was a really big success, and something to really applaud the efforts of our service providers and the mayor, um, and Hollywood is, was a successful job, too. So if you want to discuss further, if you want to discuss partnerships, if you want to just get to know me and let me know what's happening in your neighborhood, um, I went to school at Buckley, I grew up in the family, I know Sherman Oaks well, um, so you let me know how I can help, and I am happy to see a lot of people in person for once. So thank you so much. So anybody recognize this face? Okay. This is Barry. Anyone? Barry, Barry worked with Bob Hertzberg's office for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years? Feels like it. Eight years. So she has a ton of experience uh, with our community, um, and now she is with. I'll tell you. 
thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Barry Worth Gervin, and I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, as Matt said, I have a long history uh, working with Sherman Oaks, but now I am with uh, Supervisor Lindsay Horvath's office. So I'm really excited to be here on her behalf. Um, and I just wanted to kind of go back a second and say, Sherman Oaks has been historically one of my favorite communities to work with. And I worked with Sherman Oaks for eight years, all eight years in the state Senate. So I'm so glad that I got to build relationships with a lot of you over the last several years. And I couldn't be happier that I get to come back and work with you from the county side now. Um, so I'm really proud to say that I'm now with Supervisor Lindsay Horvath, and I think what you're going to see is a big, uh, big exciting difference is that Supervisor Horvath is really committed to being out in the community, and she's very excited to meet everybody, and particularly in the Valley, um, you know, where historically we just, you know, it's, she's very excited about coming out to the Valley. I'll just say she's very excited about coming out to the Valley. She was uh, at an event last week out here in the Valley, and she's, I believe, committed to coming to Soha in a couple of months. Shh, don't give it away. Uh, sorry, spoiler. <laughs> spoiler alert. So, um, but she's, she's very excited about um, getting to know everybody and working very closely with the community. She comes out of local government, so she really has full respect for all of the work that you all do in the community, um, homeowners associations and the work that we do together in local government. Um, so I just want to introduce myself and say I've uh, just started less than a week ago, so I don't have business cards yet. Um, Bob Anderson does have my email address, though. It's brand new and I'm um, still getting it up and running, but uh, I'll give it, uh, you know, maybe I'll let Bob put it on, you know, in your email, in your email uh, Newsletter. It's kind of long. I can spell it out for you now if you'd like to write it down, but it might be easier. I'll do that. Okay. Bob will circulate it for anyone, and I'm happy to um, follow up with all of you. Um, I'm going to be overseeing our field offices, and um, we're still determining our staff and building our team. So it's going to take us some time to get up and running, but we're really excited to also hit the ground running. Um, one quick update I'll just share on behalf of the supervisor, very much in line with um, the new mayor's office as well. Um, just last week, uh, Supervisor Horvath declared a state of emergency. She introduced a motion last Tuesday to declare a state of emergency on homelessness. And we've already seen this at the city of LA. And now doing this with the county allows us to work um, kind of side by side with our partners at the city and really work in conjunction. It doesn't make sense to have one jurisdiction do that, but not have the other. So really now the county and the city are working in lockstep. And what that means is that we can cut a lot of bureaucratic red tape to get things done um, a lot more efficiently and more quickly on this issue. So um, we're looking forward to that. And um, with that, I will just say I'm very happy to be working with you all and I look forward to seeing you all soon. All right, since Barry took up all the rest of the the, uh, the, the time, she was only supposed to have one minute. No, come on. Ryan. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm an outdoor voice type of guy, so I'll speak like this. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Ahari. I am the Sherman Oaks Field Deputy for Council Member Nithi Member of Genesarian as the Sherman Oaks Field Representative. It's now been two years, two whole years since I've been working with this wonderful community that I'm so lucky to be a part of. Um, and work in. So I wanted to give an update on behalf of our office. Uh, a lot of work um, on homelessness has been going on in our city. Um, like uh, my dear colleague. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> Aaron's name for a second. Aaron just mentioned uh, Inside Safe uh, was is a huge program um, that led to 29 people at the 101 Kapwanga underpass, um, getting them moved indoors and getting them sheltered. Uh, so effectively, our office was working for quite some time on indoor placement for those 29 individuals. Um, however, we didn't have the housing, so thank God the mayor stepped in and we were able to find a location um, and beds for these individuals. And so if you go there right now, um, there are no longer any individuals staying there, but 29 people have been housed, which is wonderful. Uh, I also wanted to mention Highland Gardens uh, is our largest shelter in our district um, that reopened off of COVID quarantine. It has 140 beds, and because of that, we are slowly filling those beds up. 
As of right now, 40 people are indoors. It just opened up about a week, a week and a half ago. But knock on wood, very soon we will fill all those beds to reduce homelessness on our streets. Um, I also wanted to just mention some highlights from last year. Our annual report is on our website, our annual report, which mentions all the things that we did in the previous year. And I just wanted to mention that in CD4, we resurfaced 52 streets across the district, which is about 33 miles. We created two new pickleball courts at BNSO Park. So please go enjoy yourself some pickleball. And we also worked to fund the restoration of a historical mural on Ventura alongside the Sherman Oaks Chamber Foundation. Um, just two more things I want to mention. I'm about to be called off. Um, in the Sherman Oaks newsletter, it did mention the council member's position on 41 and 18 sign placement. I did just want to reiterate her position has not changed. It is still uh, that as of right now, we are focusing on getting people indoors and housed, so not placing 4118 signs. And finally, I wanted to mention that uh, our wonderful Jody Francisco is here. We are launching the Homeless Count in Sherman Oaks next Thursday, January 24th, 7.30 to 10.30. We need more volunteers, and we'd love for you to come and join us. So that was my very long report. Thank awesome. you for bearing with me. I have cards if you'd like to get my contact information, um, and I'll be around. So thank you, everybody. Uh, the next is Sean. Sean's going to be real quick. I know that he's from Brad Sherman's office. Want to say hello? You can sit from there or here. Sure. Why not? Do it here. That we aren't here. A lot of audience. <laughs> yeah, and I am also very overdressed. So <laughs> apologies for that. But it's good to meet you all. My name is Sean Regan. I am the Sherman Oaks field rep for Congressman Sherman. I also live in Studio City. I'm about ten minutes away, so I'm a neighbor. Nice to meet you all. Very quickly, I just want to go ahead and plug our telephone town hall on February 2nd. It's going to be at 7 p.m. It's a great opportunity to talk with the congressman directly if you have any questions, really anything at all. Uh, he loves it. We love it. Our constituents love it. It's uh, honestly just one of the highlights of every month. And uh, beyond that, I also want to plug our constituent services team. Uh, they couldn't be here today, Kimberly and uh, Lisa. But <laughs> We handle everything from passports to social security to SBA loans to the IRS. So really anything to do with the federal government whatsoever. We have an open door policy. You're more than welcome to come into our office at any time. And beyond that, I do have business cards. I am out. I just, I'm on my last one. So I will symbolically leave one for you all here. Please do have more than three bots to share my information. There you go. You get double the fun. So, uh, yeah, that's essentially it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chief, hang in there with us. We get a couple more community reports and then. Okay, cool. So, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, in the back, somebody just came in the room, uh, our former state senator, uh, Bob Hertzberg. Our... He's not on the agenda, but he's been a good, 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 good friend of Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. You want to just say hello and from the back? <laughs> I've been a member for more than 30 years. All right. <laughs> All right. So chill out back there, relax. Okay, cool. So now we've got a, a few, uh, I think I covered everybody. Yeah, okay, cool. So Nancy and then John and then Maria. So let's make it quick so we can get the uh, get to business. Hi, I just want to say welcome to everybody. It's so great to see you all, and I'm glad you joined us today. Um, would the members raise their hands for a second? Who's a member here? Wonderful. I want to say thank you because of you were here, because of you were able to work on housing, protecting our neighborhoods, we're able to work on um, mass transit so we get a good solution we're able to work with our beautiful appreciated uh, partners in blue and we work for you but the only way we can do that is with membership we are totally member supported we don't get any um, funding from the city which means we are free of city and county influence. And that is very important in the work that we do. So I would encourage anybody who is not a member 
please pick up a green membership application. It tells you how you can easily join. And just remember, membership is a very small investment in your community, in protecting it, improving it, and we can't do this without you. Membership also includes our wonderful newsletter with all kinds of information and updates. So thanks for being here and join if you're not at home. So a long time SOHA member, Donia Lax uh, died recently. Uh, I think many of you remember her. Uh, about 16 years ago, I went to Richard Close and I said I wanted to do a program on the Holocaust here at SOHA and have Holocaust survivors who live in Sherman Oaks give a panel discussion. So I went to Richard and he said, well, this isn't what we usually have. We have deputy chiefs of police and we have city council people, but go ahead, put the program on. So the first person I called was Sedona. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, would you be willing to be on a panel to discuss the Holocaust? And she said, yeah, yes. And I got about three or four names of other people who survived the Holocaust. I called them all up and none of them would participate. So two weeks later, I call up Sedonia and I said, I don't have a panel, what do I do? And she said, don't worry, I'll handle this. I'll take care of this. So in June of 2007, we had Sedonia Lax as our featured speaker. And she got up here, as I'm speaking to you now, and started to tell what happened to her uh, in the death camps. And you could hear a pin drop. It was all silent, like it is now. And she captivated all of us. And she told us her story. That story you can still see today. If you go on YouTube and you go to search and you put in her name, Sedonia Lax by LAX the airport, the first thing that comes up, you will see our meeting from June of 2007. It's in four different segments, but you can hear her account of, of what she went through and it's really worthwhile to hear it again. And I think my experience with her, where she said, I got it, really reflects her life. She was, a, she was optimistic about the future, notwithstanding what she went through. And I think she could say, I got it as far as her, her life that she lived. Thank you. Uh, that was John Eisen, by the way. So next up is Maria and then Larry Slade. Um, I also want to just acknowledge, um, you know, these last couple of years have been um, tough for us as far as the community, as far as our loss. We, you know, we, 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 everyone knows we lost Richard Close, who was fantastic. We also lost Chuck Betts. Chuck Betts was uh, a board member for many, many years, a wonderful man. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very, we're very blessed when we had those, all, all three of those folks in our, in our lives for so long. So, um, Maria, what do you have for us? So I'm going to read my report, so I don't take too much time. So the legislative session uh, up in Sacramento has just begun. So we have not seen an awful lot of the bills yet. I mean, there are a lot, but we're not tracking any of them. Um, but one of the bills that we are tuning into is SB4 uh, that would allow religious and educational institutions to build shelters on, their, on the properties that they own. Um, it was meant to allow them to build shelters on their campuses, which usually are large and not used. And we're very supportive of that. But these institutions also often own or are willed single family homes and single family neighborhoods. 
and we're asking for that bill to be amended so it excludes those single homes. Um, we are meeting with assembly member uh, Laura Friedman next month and we'll be talking to her. We've already sent letters of uh, concern. Um, and so we'll let you know the LA City Council is also considering a similar motion to allow these. And again, we have met with the city council member and expressed our concern about the single family homes and not campuses being used for uh, homeless shelters. So we also are busy dealing with the LA housing element that will rezone areas in our community for more housing. Uh, the housing element shows affordable housing overlays in our single family, in some of our single family neighborhoods, which would allow apartments to be built in our single family neighborhoods. Uh, we formed a coalition with Studio City and Encino and we worked to try to find enough zoning in our community that could be put on our commercial corridors that would allow us to meet the housing needs that we have to come up with without affecting our single family and multifamily areas. So we were successful in doing that. We found plenty of locations for un un on underutilized commercial corridors. So we have met many months now with the planning department, all the top staff there, shown them some tremendous um, presentations that we have made. And last Friday, when we met with them again, they told us they have taken the overlays off the table. We are not sure that that means they'll stay off the table. So we know it is not easy to get rid of sites without adding new sites. So we're going to keep working with them. We're hoping to be partners with them so that we can solve the housing issue without affecting our single family and our multifamily neighborhoods. So that's it for me. Good evening. Uh, my name is Larry Slade, and I have the honor of uh, being a board member of SOHA and the chair of the Homelessness Committee, which we formed about six months ago. I want to start by giving a quick shout out to uh, my committee members who have been very helpful. Uh, three board members, Tom Glick, uh, John Eisen, and uh, Sean Kurzweil. Also on the committee is Leslie Elkin, who's the president of the Sherman Oaks Bid, Craig Nizek, Ryan Muckenthaler, and Brett, uh, Beth Hefner. Um, we've been working on trying to figure out how we can be of, of assistance in trying to mitigate the impact of homelessness in Sherman Oaks. It's reached a bit of a fever pitch, especially on Ventura Boulevard uh, and around businesses. It's one thing if someone's pushing a cart down the street and collecting bottles. It's another thing if someone's camping out underneath um, an overpass. It's a whole completely different thing if someone is camping out in front of a business treating it as their, their bedroom, their bathroom, interfering with the operations of the business and really overwhelmingly disrupting the joy and peace that is part of our community, why we love it and why we're all committed to working here and living here. Um, and so what we're working on is trying to figure out how to address the most uh, intractable problems of homelessness, which are those of the, um, the mentally ill um, and people who um, have all kinds of addictions and present a danger to themselves and to others on the streets. So we're trying to focus on that top layer. And we've been encouraged recently by what the new mayor is doing, by what the um, uh, the, uh, the, new, the county is doing to try to coordinate efforts to uh, address the problem. The county is responsible for mental health issues and the city is responsible for housing issues. And they were not really working together that well. The declaration of the state of emergency should um, uh, facilitate them working together and hopefully uh, uh, getting something done. Over the last uh, 15 years, we voted and allocated billions of dollars in bond measures to try to address this problem. And the problem has continued to get worse and worse. It's fed by the economy, it's fed by the pandemic, it's fed by mental illness, um, and it's, it, it, it's fed by inflation as well. It's a, uh, it's a seed that's fed by mineral rivers, and we're trying to see if we can be uh, a coordinating force between the police department, between the private organ money, so maybe we can do some cleanup and some maintenance on the boulevard and, and uh, polish up our community again. So thank you for your support. We're hard at work trying to do this. It is a difficult and long-standing problem. We're not going to resolve it overnight. We're not going to solve it. 
But what we'd like to do is cut it back to the point where it's not nearly as bad as it is now. It's not in our face the way it is. And that we actually have effective services to help these people because we're sensitive to the plight of the homeless. We're sensitive to the plight of people who are mentally ill. But there comes a point where it interferes with the use and enjoyment of our community to the point where something has to give. And that's where we are now. So thank you for your support. <laughs> All right, our, our last uh, committee report before we get to the, the real business at hand is Bob Anderson. Bob Anderson is our new vice president of this organization and our uh, featured pianist. Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob is a great asset to this community. So the amount of work this guy does is is unbelievable. So give your report and give him a big hand. Before I forget, uh, Linda and Marty at the back said a couple of people came up to them and said, how do I find out if I'm still a SOHA member? The answer is email us at SOHA914 at gmail.com. SOHA, like Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, 914 at gmail.com. Tom will forward that to me and I'll look you up in the database and we'll let you know. And if you're not, we'll ask you for money so you can join. <laughs> so that's good for everybody. I uh, don't want to forget. I do a lot of work with Metro. It's very interesting. I've, I've asked Metro 75 questions in writing, and I've actually never gotten an answer from them on any of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. So finally, when they wouldn't answer anything, I went out and read every Metro document I could find, about 3,000 pages. And I put together everything I know about the project you're looking at through the Sepulveda Pass on one piece of paper. And I checked it with Maria. She's a really hard judge. And she said, this is pretty good. And I checked it with her husband. And he said, not bad. But this is stuff Metro has known for two and a half years. It's in their documents if you're willing to dig through that kind of stuff. And I'm going to put it out. Now, Saturday, and if you have a question, there's an email address on the bottom you can send questions to. And we give a fair shake to all of these. Uh, alternative four is bad for Sherman Oaks because it's above ground. But we're trying to be fair and get information out so you can make the right decision and you can make the right comments when the time comes. Saturday, Metro is holding an open house in the Valley at the Broad Center, which is on Van Nuys Boulevard near the City Hall area up there. It's from nine in the morning until noon. It's an open house. There won't be a presentation with Q&A. It's not going to be that. We understand there's going to be tables, and you're going to be able to go and ask questions to the various people at the various tables. And I'm going to go see what it's at, and I'm going to bring my little sheet along and say, why haven't you told me this? And we'll see if they'll, if they'll do it. Saturday. Saturday at Broad. Open house itself? It's an open at 9 to 12. Where? The Browdy Center, which is up on the corner of Van Nuys and Sylvan. 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 Thank you. And Bob's hanging around, so if you don't if you want more information afterwards, you can get the address. Glad to. Thank you, Bob. Okay. So, um, Chief, you want to come on up? Um, Jay Weitzler has one quick uh, mention Actually, I forgot. two quick things. Yeah. As you can see from Bob's presentation, Metro is not the most transparent organization, but if you like Metro, you're going to love this one. At the Hillside Federation meeting last night, uh, it was disclosed that they are reaching out to the, to the sign people to put digital billboards at the major intersections above the freeways. So if you, if you think texting is bad, just can't wait until everybody looks at the billboards. It, it's really going to be fun. One other thing, my wife is working with an organization called the Valley Volunteer League. It's a charitable organization. They help clothe and give supplies to school children. It's a wonderful organization. She is selling Mahjong cards at the same price you could get them anywhere. But the organization does keep a couple of bucks off the cards and it's a fundraising device for them. So if anybody here, any men or women here like to play Mahjong, haven't gotten their cards, Linda Wexler sitting right here, the pretty lady with a mask. She's selling them and would love to have your business. Awesome. Thank you. So 
just so you guys know, we are, this organization loves hard work, as you can see. If any of you in this room, a chord was struck as far as if you want to work on a committee, come talk to the committee chair that you heard from tonight. So I'd like to work on the unhoused committee. You'd like to work on the metro committee. You'd like to work on your Mahjong game. So, you know, come to us afterwards and uh, my wife buys her Mahjong cards every year. Um, okay, so our featured speakers uh, tonight is, uh, is Chief Hamilton. Um, he has been, uh, he's the top cop of the Valley, guys. He is, um, you know, we have a great list of, of speakers that are going to be uh, coming on board that, that we've already got commitments from for this year. You know, you all, you all know that we get some great speakers here. When we when I talked to the board, when we when we started planning for the in-person, the number one topic that we have from our members, from you guys, is crime. And and so it, with with not, not even close seconds, you were the number one person that we wanted to hear from tonight. First of all, you're 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 a great friend of this community, um, and and you're very committed to the uh, to the community. Uh, your team is great as well. Um, but we're we're very honored to have you here, and I'd like to say, you know, come on up, tell us a few things that we got. To try. Okay, I'm going to use my outside voice. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah. I know if Bob can hear me. I'm good to go. All right. Okay. Um, so first off, uh, Matt, thank you very much for the invite. I want to um, preface my remarks with this. Um, We've had, a, we've had a challenging number of years. Uh, I know we've been uh, doing Hollywood Squares for a long time, but I can't tell you how glad I, am, glad I am to be out here with the community in person and uh, having this meeting with all of you tonight. Uh, please save your questions. Uh, I have uh, some uh, resources that we've looked up today, uh, but I thought the best resource for one of the most vexing questions uh, in Sherman Oaks and one of the most concerning issues, um, people experiencing homelessness. Um, I have my friend, uh, Billy Brockway, who's trying to sneak out the door over here. Uh, Commander Brockway is the homeless coordinator for the Los Angeles Police Department. And uh, I figured instead of me giving you half truths, I can uh, actually get the full truth out of Billy tonight. So he is going to assist me with any questions you may have regarding uh, any homelessness issues, um, the interface of homelessness and crime, and what we're actually responsible for and where we can help the most. Um, I, you know, and, and it's interesting. I know I know, crime has continued to be uh, an issue here. I have, some, I have a mixed bag for you tonight. I have some good news. I have some not so good news. Um, so we're going to go over the stats. We're going to talk about some numbers a little bit. And then we're going to talk about um, how we're going to solve some of these vexing issues going forward. Uh, I'm going to, um, in the meantime, you know, uh, thank uh, Captain Sue Patelli and, of course, obviously, Roman Saldana, who's like, he's over there working right now. Uh, I'm going to thank them for all the hard work that they've done this year. Uh, they've been very responsive um, to a lot of the questions uh, that the community has had. I will tell you right now, sometimes I'm included on the emails, but it's my policy to allow the officers and the command to work the problem before I get involved. I have full confidence in the people that are here in uh, Sherman Oaks, um, all the way down to the patrol officers. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, Andy Trock out here, some of the other Van Nuys patrol officers. They're all great people. The men and women out here in Van Nuys truly want to keep your community safe, and they truly want to work very hard in this community to make sure that you not only have the visibility, but that you have the results. Because at the end of the day, results matter and the numbers matter. So uh, that's what we're here about. Um, I'm going to also talk about uh, some of the non-law enforcement challenges uh, that we hopefully can help you with. Uh, one of my big things is I don't think that you can have a successful valley without supporting commerce as well. And quite often, um, it's kind of like business is kind of like the forgotten partner. And, and I, that's, that's why you see me at a lot of chamber events. You see me out and about a lot um, with those kinds of events. If we, if we don't keep commerce going, we're going to have a, a different really big problem, okay? So uh, I'm all about supporting small businesses, big businesses, any businesses that want to come to the Valley and operate successful. Uh, because without a vibrant business community, uh, we're going to have some major problems out here, okay? 
So um, I have some of the, um, I know there's been, uh, you know, a lot of concern about 2022 uh, with violent crime here at Sherman Oaks. So we've crushed the numbers, we've looked uh, very closely, and I, and I can tell you that although there was an increase citywide in robberies, um, we have not had, and we have not seen the same thing here in Sherman Oaks. We have, we have not seen the same level of increase in robberies. I know there were some high profile incidents at the beginning of last year regarding uh, some of these follow home robberies. Um, our chief put together a task force where uh, he basically stole some of our best detectives here at Van Nuys and uh, put them in the mix with robbery homicide division. And we jumped on this problem before it continued to grow. Um, by March of last year, we were approaching 100 follow home robberies in the city and the projected numbers were not looking good. So we put together a task force that worked very closely with our um, special investigation section, our robbery homicide division, and some of our other federal partners and started identifying some of the repeat offenders that were involved in some of these follow home robberies, many of them which uh, included people using firearms. So um, we were able to make uh, in excess of 140 arrests of these suspects uh, in 2022, shut down completely some of the crews. Um, we, we had some specific cases where people were followed here uh, to Sherman Oaks, were followed to Studio City, were followed to Valley Village, and uh, we had successful arrests, and those people are awaiting trial on those prosecutions right now. So I know you hear a lot of things about, like, we arrest people and they don't get filed on and all the other stuff. When it comes to these major players in terms of some of these follow-home robberies, we have sought and obtained successful filings with violent crime enhancements on some of these cases, particularly the ones in the Valley. So we're doing pretty good there. Um, that has caused the numbers in the back half of 2022 to go down drastically. And we have not seen that activity that you've been seeing on the news occurring out here again in the San Fernando Valley. So we were successful there in, in that respect. Um, in terms of homicides, you know, in, in the prior year, we had um, three. And in 2022, within Sherman Oaks, we only had one. Uh, so that, that was a good decrease right there. Um, so in terms of part one crime overall, which part one crime are the major crime categories, the eight major crime categories, um, we saw an increase of only 6%, but that was mainly because of property crime. So um, going back to the pandemic, because we had a lot of businesses that were closed, we had very limited uh, interaction with the, with the public. Uh, a lot of places were still kind of closed down at the beginning of 2022. There was not that much commerce activity and there was not that much pedestrian activity and activity out in the community in the neighborhood. So with that being said, with everything opening back up, we started to see the rise in theft again at retail establishments. And we started to see now that people are leaving their residence and going back to work, in some cases, going back to work, what did we start seeing during the day, daytime again? Daytime home burglaries, exactly. So we are on that. That is our area of biggest concern right now in the San Fernando Valley as a whole. But I will tell you, it is one of my concerns in Sherman Oaks in particular. Um, people come to these areas for one reason. And, and this is not just South of Ventura Hillside homes, folks. They come to this area for one reason, because they know that if they can get in your house, that you're probably going to have, you know, fairly valuable items inside of your residence. So we have to harden the target at all times. Um, you have to speak to each other as neighbors. You have to. You have to have your block club meetings, your neighborhood watch meetings. You have to meet with your slow so that we can harden the target, make sure we have video surveillance, uh, work closely with our private security uh, individuals, our contractors that have ALPRs, cameras, et cetera. All of those things that are available to your community, if we can put those together in a coordinated manner, and make sure that we have, and I'm, again, I'm not saying put an iron ring around Sherman Oaks, but what I am saying is neighbors need to watch out for each other. That, quite simply, that's what I'm saying. Um, the suspects we are arresting that we're actually catching doing the burglaries, they don't live in Sherman Oaks. So that kind of makes it pretty easy too. So if you see something, I, I'm asking you one thing, if you visually see something, and you don't know that it's, a, I mean, if you see someone backing out of a front door with a safe, that's, I'm going to go, I'm going to call that a burglary. I'm going to ask you to call 911. 
<laughs> but let's say you see some other suspicious type activity. That's what your senior lead officers are for. They should be your point of coordination when you see these things. You give them the information, they give it to the detectives, they give it to the patrol officers. They go and bribe the patrol officers that are working their area to come down here and do extra patrol and look for specific things. And that's how this works, folks. If we keep that network tight and we keep that going, people are not going to return here to do burglaries because we're going to keep arresting them. And that tends to really deter people when they're doing burglaries. Now, when it comes to property crimes, I cannot guarantee you that we're always going to get successful filings, but we try in every instance where we arrest suspects for burglaries to get a felony file. That's where we start. Quite often, if it's someone that doesn't have a record, it'll be passed along as a misdemeanor. We still pursue that. As our city attorney will tell you, they pursue that. Because the last message we want to send is that we want people to take the chance and roll the dice on getting filed on for a burglary here in Sherman Oaks and have them think that they're going to get away with it with just a slap on the wrist. So we will prosecute that all the way through to every available system. I will also tell you that um, you, you will not see this, uh, or you may see it, but um, because of the prevalence of burglaries here in the and we have a collaboration group going with the LA County Sheriff's Department, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, our commercial crimes detectives, mature county sheriffs, and the district attorney's investigators. Um, to provide surveillance assets. So when we identify certain suspects, uh, they are actually being investigated. That's a euphemism for being followed. They're being investigated by plainclothes officers and undercover officers that are trying to determine their patterns of behavior so that they can take effective enforcement action if they see them committing a crime. So the translation on that is they're following them until they commit a crime and we're gonna arrest them with uniformed assets. So you may see some of that going on in the community. Um, you know, just be aware that that is happening out here. And that is one of the tools that we are using to try to prevent some of these uh, burglaries that are happening. Again, residential burglaries, my, my greatest concern. Uh, I, I agree that sometimes commercial burglaries are important, but those are businesses and they're generally going to be closed. My nightmare scenario is someone actually doing a burglary here and then someone being home. And I don't want that to come to, to Sherman Oaks and I don't want that to come to Operation Valley River. So that's why we're emphasizing this, the enforcement right now on burglaries. The other area of contention, catalytic converters. <laughs> so there's new legislation that's helping us out a little bit on the tracking, identification, and recycling of catalytic converters. I've read the reports. I'm sure some of you in here have been victimized by these catalytic converter thefts. Yes, we've had quite a number of them here in Sherman Oaks. Your numbers are not as high as Studio City and Valley Village um, and uh, Woodland Hills. Uh, for some reason, for everything that's south of Roscoe, those three areas just continually get hit. Um, we've had nights in North Hollywood where we've had like 11 taken in one night in a fairly small geographic area. We've also made some really good arrests and done some really good follow-ups. Um, you may have seen a pursuit that happened in the middle of the year where they were you know, putting out that we had catalytic converter death suspects from Topanga Division. Um, we we in, ended up finally getting those suspects into custody, two saw saws, uh, stolen catalytic converters, and a gun. So um, yes, they're property crime suspects, but it's very common for us to find guns on these suspects as well. That's why I would ask when you see these things going on in the community in progress, just dial 911 and remain inside and we'll, we will handle the rest. Uh, big thing on these catalytic converter um, thefts, when you can get a license plate, that's great because we will then do an investigation into the license plate and use some of our tools and techniques to try and determine where these people have been uh, match them up to the arrest, uh, to the crime reports, and then try and take them into custody. So that's where the eyes and ears of the community come into helping us take these suspects into custody in a lawful manner. Uh, numbers wise, in terms of property crime, uh, we actually did pretty decent here in uh, uh, Operation Valley Bureau. 
uh, but we did have a little bit of an increase in property crime of about 8.5%. Um, in terms of uh, the value overall, uh, we did have that increase that I talked about in robbery citywide and in the Valley, but you are not as affected here at Sherman Oaks with the robbery angle, which is, that's the one that I really worry about. Um, unfortunately, in 2021 and 2022, the number of robberies that we had involving firearms increased dramatically in the city of Los Angeles. Um, you may have heard of the term ghost gun. Uh, a ghost gun is nothing but a gun that does not have a serial number that cannot be traced. Um, we have a lot of ghost guns in the valley, a lot. We're probably going to have over a thousand confiscated uh, in the valley alone this year. Uh, we'll, we'll get somewhere near that number. Uh, previously, we were up at about 780, 790. Uh, they're, they're very prevalent. They're very easy to obtain. You literally can go on the internet and obtain one, and then you need two bolts uh, in order to complete the assembly of a gun. So that is uh, something that we're dealing with out here in the community. Uh, we have an undercover ATF task force that works very, very closely. With the federal government, and we are uh, working on identifying not necessarily who has the guns, but working on where they're coming. We do have that concern regarding uh, a lot of suspects that are out here that are armed with guns. Going to the theft numbers, uh, I can tell you that uh, we're up a little. Probably don't have to tell the people in this room and on this Zoom that uh, quite a a a a decent number of our thefts involve people experiencing homelessness. Um, so when we encounter that, we do still take, we don't give, we don't cut breaks just because of someone's, you know, social status. When we run across criminal acts that are committed, whether it is a petty theft, a grand theft, a burglary from a motor vehicle, um, when it's involving someone that's experiencing homelessness, we still have to do our job. So we still conduct an investigation. Quite often, we still do an arrest, and that will lead to a prosecution. So we're doing that in theft, but our theft numbers are going up because everything's back open again. So we did have a slight increase in Sherman Oaks. We had an, it definitely had an increase in Operations Valley Bureau. Um, areas where we were not seeing those numbers because people were not in malls, they were not in business establishments. Now that they've returned, we've seen those numbers go up again. So areas like supermarkets, uh, some of your big box stores, uh, people were places where people commonly go to commit, I mean, to uh, engage in commerce. We saw those numbers stay pretty consistent. It's when people started returning to malls, uh, people started coming out shopping for the holidays, that kind of stuff. We saw those numbers increase. So we're working on that um, as well around the, around the valley. So that's kind of the the, the numbers mix um, in terms of the. Vehicle theft numbers, uh, Sherman Oaks actually did pretty good. The rest of the valley actually was down this year. The rest of the city, though, if you compare it to the pre-pandemic, pre-unrest numbers, um, the numbers from 2019 to now were up over 60% in vehicle theft. Now, I will give everyone in here one guess as to what our most vexing issue is in terms of vehicles being stolen in Sherman Oaks. Unlocked. Wait, somebody, someone said it. Unlocked. Well, unlocked is one thing. Leaving the keys in the vehicle. <laughs> okay. So if I'm, if I'm Johnny Parkey and I come walking along and I see Candace Park car, what am I going to do? Check the cars for keys. Why am I going to check Candace Park vehicles for keys? Because what do we do when we want to make sure that car in the front can be moved easily? Folks, twenty percent of the vehicles stolen were stolen with keys. Wow. I can't make it any easier than that. <laughs> I mean, when you could just get in the car because it's unlocked and just push on the brake pedal and hit go. We need to secure the keys to the car. <laughs> so is it, is it leaving the keys on the front left tire? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. we don't want to make it too hard. Yeah. Here's the thing, folks. <clears throat> if you had like a little mug right inside the front door or by the garage door or maybe a hook somewhere, the hook can even be like right there by the door. I would ask you to put it a little bit further away to make it a little more challenging. 
but keep the keys inside. <laughs> if you did that, our numbers would probably go down 10%, just like that in the valley. And don't worry, Sherman Oaks, it's not just Sherman Oaks. Trust me when I tell you that. Um, Woodland Hills and Encino apparently are giving you a run for your money. <laughs> Especially if you know that some of your neighbors have had their cars stolen recently because these things, we get what we call car clotters. So car clotters are people that identify an area, usually high density area where there are a lot of vehicles. And they'll do multiple burglary from motor vehicles. They'll break into multiple cars continuously until they get caught because it's right there. If they know they can come back to tandem parking or an area where people are leaving their keys in their car, they're going to keep coming back. And, you know, it's they're not going to take your car and strip it or anything like that. But quite often, these cars are stolen because they're going to be used in other crimes. You see some of the smashing grabs that are happening? Don't come and steal your car because they're going to commit the smashing grab and then they're going to dump that car after it gets used. And I don't have to tell you what happens on the news in these pursuits when they get used. So they'll dump that car somewhere a mile away and then switch back to their own car, their friend's car, and then they'll jump in that car, take all the loot, and they're out of there. And your car's sitting there idling at the end of a cul-de-sac. If we make it easy for the suspects, they will gladly oblige, gladly. Okay, come up with an ideal of where these keys can be kept, not necessarily securely, but kept hopefully hidden nearby the door where you can just grab the keys, go out, move the car, put the keys back in. Something as simple as that will build resistance into the Grand Theft Auto problem here. Because I'm telling you, um, motor vehicle theft, we had it, 2018, 2019, we're really getting a handle on that here in Los Angeles. We're working very closely with the Sheriff's Department in their TRAP program, which is targeting repeat uh, aggressive uh, uh, predators. All these people, which, which you will find a lot of the times for car theft, is just the same people doing the same thing again, going in and out of prison. And a lot of these people, they, they commit so many grand thefts that they end up in prison. So what happens is they get good at the game. But we don't want them practicing in Sherman Oaks. Okay, we want to build in resistance so that when they come here, it's harder for them to get a car. Okay, they're not going to strip your. It's, this is not like you know stripping your car and selling parts. That very, 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 very rarely happens now, um, just because of the way vehicles are designed and how things are done, and and some of the security markets. What they're typically doing is they're stealing your car for either transportation or they're stealing it because they're going to use it to commit another. And then you have to deal with the crimes that they commit that are now on that vehicle. So these are things that we're trying to avoid here in Sherman Oaks. A couple other things that are going on here. Um, so we have um, Urban Alchemy out here. Maybe some of you have seen them. Uh, they're working with uh, the mayor's office. They're, they're a contract organization started in San Francisco. And they're out here now trying to help in uh, some of the localized RDs here in uh, Sherman Oaks and here in, in Van Nuys Division. Um, so you'll see them out here uh, interacting with people experiencing homelessness. Um, that is a city uh, entity that's con that they're contracting with. And this is not a um, this is not something where they're working like necessarily hand in hand with the police. Um, in, in fact, generally, they try to uh, stay um, not necessarily really associated with the, the police departments where, they're con where they contract out. Uh, but certainly if they have any, any issues and they need help uh, in terms of, you know, being the victims of a criminal act or something like that, we'll respond right away and, and assist them. Um, so we've had a couple of gun buyback events here in Van Nuys, uh, very successful as well, where we take guns and we um, uh, take them off of people's hands and we give them a uh, gift card typically or some other kind of exchange. So we've been doing that. Uh, we've been uh, providing our run, hide, fight presentations to groups and organizations throughout the Valley. So that's available. Um, the circle program is actually gonna be um, going here in Van Nuys Division a little bit further north of here though, right? They're still staying north of Oxnard, is that accurate? So they're gonna be just outside of Sherman Oaks. Um, but the circle program is again, a, um, a model of, of providing resources to uh, people experiencing homelessness. And uh, Commander Brockway will be able to give you a little bit more information on that. What other areas, if you're interested, 
But in terms of what they're doing here, um, instead of calling 911 and being routed to our communications here for PD, we're now off-wrapping some of those calls that are that are of a lower um, intensity to the SERPA program. And they're responding in a, in a van. You, you can't miss it. It's a van that has circle with a circle around it. And uh, they will respond and they will provide resources and outreach to people experiencing homelessness and mental health issues. So um, that's going now on a, uh, on a, in a uh, I guess you call it a pilot basis here in, throughout different areas of uh, the city. And that includes here in the San Fernando Valley. Um, I've already gone over the uh, Berkeley Working Group. So I know we were talking about volunteers earlier. And, and so I'm gonna say a couple of things about volunteerism. Um, Van Nuys Division is always looking for volunteers to come and help with the police department. Um, you know, you're, this is this is not your old. Um, this is like not like volunteering in the old days where you were only going to work the front desk. This is not that anymore. We have volunteers throughout the valley doing bike details, uh, mounted details. Um, they're doing community surveillance, uh, cease operations. And they're doing volunteer community patrol, which some of you have seen them up in the BMW i3s in the white uniforms. Those are vetted volunteers, and we are looking for more volunteers in the Valley. Um, there are actually more volunteers in the Valley than the rest of the city combined right now. And we are always looking to add to our numbers. And people say, well, Chief Hamilton, why are you always pushing for more numbers on volunteers? Um, we're down about 875 officers from where we're supposed to be, okay? So um, it's not that I'm looking for free labor, hmm. but I'm looking for free labor. Um, I'm also trying to prepare for the next disaster because if there's one thing I've learned in my limited uh, 30 plus years in the LAPD, there's always gonna be a next disaster. And if you think that when the 7.0 earthquake hits, the LAPD is gonna be able to respond and do everything, uh, I'm here to tell you, um, I actually was working here, uh, when Northridge hit, and I'm just telling you, we run out of officers really quick when that happens. Uh, first, they have to be able to actually get here, you know, so this, we start there. And then, um, you know, we run out of officers really fast because as soon as they come in, they go back out. We are in a position where we have to rely on each other, okay? We will provide training and equipment to our volunteers so that when we have those disasters, you're properly equipped to help us out. Okay, we're getting ready to have our first uh, disaster preparedness fair in three years over in Woodland Hills. We're going to get back into CEMP training with LAFD. We're going to get back into disaster preparedness um, here in this region. I can't control what happens outside of the valley, but I want the valley prepared for any disaster, whether it's a brush fire, floods, earthquake, locust plague coming over the Santa Susana Mountains, whatever happens, I want to make sure we're ready. Um, it can be something as simple as um, a spot brush fire in a particular area, or it could be something as disastrous as a plane crash here in the valley. You know, a lot of people forget we have major airlines coming into Burbank all the time, right over the San Fernando Valley. And the actually the bomb field TCA goes the other way over the San Fernando Valley. So lots of opportunity for a whole lot of things to go sideways in the valley. And again, the bottom line is um, our deployment in the valley is down about 20% right now. So back about five years ago, we had just over 2,200 officers assigned to the valley when we had Valley Traffic Division under us as well. Now we're down to just over 1,700. So mathematically, uh, if you extract out the VTD numbers, we're short about almost 250 officers here in the San Fernando Valley. So we are asking, I would say begging, but I don't like that word, but we are asking, <laughs> um, asking people to come forward. If you have the ability to uh, come forward and volunteer at Van Nuys Station, we have a volunteer coordinator officer that is responsible for just the volunteers. And uh, that individual, he or she will help you get uh, fully vetted as a volunteer and uh, help you uh, get into the fold. And you'll see things that are wonderful. We'll put you through the police, uh, I'm gonna say police academy, but I don't mean <laughs> the six month police academy. We have an eight week uh, community police academy that we run up at um, 
up at Davis. And uh, it is really, really exciting. It's really good stuff. Uh, you'll do the forced option simulator where you get to dress up as a police officer and do the video game thing. Uh, we have um, homicide detectives that will come in and talk about crime scenes. We have our communications that will come in and talk about how 911 really works. Uh, it's, it's a great tool for showing you what we do and how we do it on the LAPD. So you sign up to volunteer, we'll get you in one of those classes. What are we running those four times a year now, five times a year? Four times. And uh, every once a year we do a Spanish Academy, is that correct? So, so that's available to the community, total charge, including tax, free. <laughs> free, best we can do. Um, so a couple of other things we have going on uh, before I take questions. Um, we have a, um, I know I already referred to our ATF uh, task force. We have an FBI task force as well. Uh, they work undercover throughout the Valley with our uh, federal law enforcement partners investigating some of these serious violent crimes. They are based at Operations Valley Bureau and work directly for me. Um, and they have, uh, we've done things all the way up to a 35 gun purchase to walk away. So we do a lot of those things. Um, that are not visible necessarily to the public, but we're doing these things to make the community safer. Uh, we have the San Fernando Valley Coalition on Games uh, that we still have uh, going, we're going on year 24 now. And it is a coalition of different community members, different community organizations and the LAPD and some of our other sister and brother law enforcement agencies. We meet once a month and we talk about issues of community concern regarding our youth, and getting people that are involved in um, incarceration, probation, parole, stuff like that, back into the fold, and getting juvenile intervention and diversion so that they do not become, you know, involved and engaged in criminal activity as well. Um, one of the things I'm doing now with um, some of the coalition members, we've done a number of different um, venues where we do a fentanyl presentation, where we talk about the dangers of fentanyl. Um, Unfortunately, here in the San Fernando Valley, the fentanyl overdose deaths in 2022, when the coroner does actually catch up because they've got an eight month backlog, uh, we will probably exceed 300 fentanyl overdose deaths in the San Fernando Valley. Wow. That exceeds the number of traffic collision fatalities and murders twofold, almost double. And we have a lot of fatal traffic collisions and we have a lot of homicides. Well, we don't have a lot of homicides. I'm going to scare you, but we, we do have some homicides here in the Valley. The fentanyl numbers, though, the fentanyl overdose numbers are absolutely out of control. Um, and when I say fentanyl overdose numbers, these are numbers that are verified by the LA County Coroner's Office conclusively tracked back to fentanyl use. These, these are not, this is not a, a guess. This is not an assumption scientifically concluded back to fentanyl. We have a fentanyl problem in all of our communities in the Valley. And folks, that includes Sherman Oaks. Okay, it is a problem out here. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just the kids. I've read the reports. It's not just the kids. It's not. So it's something we need to be aware of. Um, I think our next one, we're trying to get one together with Cal State Northridge. We're doing these around the Valley. Uh, we've done them at different venues. Um, typically, I present with Albert Molina, and we'll have our detectives from our narcotics, and we'll also have someone from the DEA. Um, the numbers are staggering. And, and, the, and this is not someone else's community, folks. This is our community where this is happening, okay? More than likely, LA County will end up over 2,000. Uh, by, the, by the time the numbers are actually counted and verified for 2022, which will not happen until August. Those numbers will be somewhere in the 2000 plus range. Um, each one of those fully preventable. Talk to your kids, talk to your relatives. Please make sure that they are not experimenting with anything even close to fentanyl. And uh, lastly, I wanna cover um, the community. So there are a lot of things that are going on in the community quite often that, um, you know, we can we can help out with or be involved and engaged with. Please reach out to your senior leads. Please reach out to the pro and slow office so that we can become involved and engaged. Beyond the Halloween uh, truck or treat and beyond um, our holiday stuff, I, I just want to say we want to be involved in everything. Coffee with a cop, phone with a cop, 
all of those different, uh, we'll in involve ourselves with your athletic events, all of those things. We want to be a partner with you and help out where we can. And that's also where the volunteers come in because we'll actually try and help you put on your event. Um, I think uh, other than that, uh, let's see here. In terms of, um, I, so I know there are going to be questions about, you know, the, the situation regarding people experiencing homelessness. So I want to say this, what I ask my officers to do is help where they can, but our focus will primarily remain engaged uh, in the homeless community that is committing crime. In terms of the individuals that are not committing crimes, our mayor's goal is to, well, number one, house them and provide wraparound services, but number two, not take a law enforcement first approach. And I'm just gonna be very blunt and honest with everyone here. We do not have the resources to take that on in the LAPD. Um, we're working on just getting crime. So we're, we're, we don't have the resources, but we are willing to help wherever we can. Um, we are aware that there are issues with some of the other city entities where they do not want to engage without the LAPD by their side. And we work very closely with those city agencies. But the LAPD will not be the primary responder to the homelessness issue. Um, but at the same time, we are not going to allow people just because of their social status to commit crime. That's not going to happen. If we become aware of it, we will respond, investigate, and effect an arrest if lawful. Okay? Um, so that's the presentation. I'm ready for the question. Yeah, did you want to talk about the... Come on up. So, so before I start, I want to I want to have Commander Brockway just talk briefly about some of the initiatives on the LAPD side regarding all this. So I know this is uh, we're going to lose some of these folks. If you do leave before we're done, um, a couple of things. Please take any garbage that's on your table, but don't leave because we've got some good questions. Uh, but if you have to leave, you have to leave. So um, and, and again, we have a handful of questions. So Bill, you're up. Hi, everybody. Billy Brockway. I, as I know a lot of people that are here today. I was a captain of Van Nuys a few years ago. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And <laughs> so uh, I am the Department of Homeless Coordinator. What that means, I write the policy, I teach, I learn, but more than anything, I facilitate the conversations that we're having now. A lot of the issues and concerns that we've been seeing is the lack of pretty much understanding because this is a very complex problem, very complex. In the past, it, it would always fall on us to try to take care of everything. But the bottom line is this, we, we wanna make sure that you know that the city family is working cohesively together. I will tell you that what Karen Bass has put together, the mayor's office with the council district and the county and the city and the state is impressive. Uh, I grew up in Los Feliz. I grew up in Hollywood. The 101 in Cuenca has been a problem since I was a kid. They took an approach, I mean, the mayor's office and city, to reach out with outreach providers, identify housing, bring in the county for mental health issues and concerns, house people voluntarily, and then triage, case manage. Normally, if somebody goes into housing, we would see somebody would stick around for about 30 days to stay in the housing and then come out. Uh, Nithi Raman's crew at, at CD4 created a multidisciplinary team a couple of years ago to address this without law enforcement. So when Karen Bass and her team declared an emergency, that brought everybody together. And I will tell you that that, that team is robust. Uh, we have this thing called the Unified Homeless Response Center in downtown, where we come together as a city family to address everything that we possibly can on a daily basis. So that, that location is getting bigger and bigger. So it's Department of Mental Health, Department of Health Services, nonprofits. So we have conversations every single day to talk about what's working, what's not working. Going back to Hollywood, the outreach providers went out there, identified 29 individuals that were experiencing homelessness, built a relationship with them. They voluntarily went into housing, triage, as I mentioned before, and case managed. All 29 of those individuals have been homeless for a lot of years, are in housing and transitioning into long-term housing. It's absolutely amazing to see. I drove by there on Sunday. There's been no repopulation issues. There's no trash. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. 
Uh, fast forward to Pacific Division, which was the next location. 92 individuals were identified. Uh, I know I look young, but in 1990, I was a senior, no, junior at USC studying real estate development. That area was so bad that 25 years ago, uh, Gita O'Neill, neighborhood prosecutor, that was her first project. And she works with me now. She's my homeless city attorney for the city. Uh, and we all kind of raised an eyebrow thinking, is this going to work again? And within two weeks, that area, we had 92 individuals who accepted housing, are still in housing, getting triaged, case managed, mental health addressing, which you mentioned earlier, which we all mentioned earlier, and they're still there. And they're going to go into interim housing and uh, long-term housing. I drove through Oceanfront Walk. I drove through Pacific Division on Sunday. I got to see Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is cool. Uh, but outside of that, no repopulation, nothing. So it, it works. And I know what you're saying. When are we coming to the valley? Yeah. That that role, that decision is made by the mayor's office. They're working on the next location, but they don't want to just go and start trying to clean. They want to build relationships. And you can't do that until you have everybody on board, which she has done, and then make sure you have the housing. You can't ask somebody to come off the streets you don't have housing so i really want you to take a little bit of a step back for a second and think of it this way when you see somebody who's experiencing homelessness somebody who has mental health that's 30 years old they weren't they weren't born that way they weren't born a 30 year old person with bipolar disorder they weren't born 35 years old with a substance abuse issue they came from somewhere and it's our role is to Get that voluntary compliance the best we can. Like the chief said, there are predators out there. There are real bad predators uh, that sometimes mask themselves as homeless, but more than anything, prey on the homeless. Uh, I will tell you over the last year, statistically, if you were homeless, the, the chance of you being a victim of a crime, down 5%. If you are a suspect that's homeless, down 5%. That's not too shabby, but qualitatively, when we go out here and see these encampments, it's not the prettiest thing to see. Uh, I still live in Los Feliz. I still see it every day. Uh, but I, I can tell you the model the mayor has put in place with the help of the council district, with the help of the county, with the help of the state, with the help of the feds, it's a model that is working. It's going to be a marathon. It's going to be a marathon. But I'll tell you what, we're committed to this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We will support. If you look at the operation that the mayor puts together, uh, you list outreach, departmental health, the council district, sanitation, department of transportation, Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, and a bunch of other people. And then over here, the LAPD. We're there to provide a working ability for everyone to be able to do their job and make a difference. So it's not going to happen overnight. We are not going to have everyone off the streets. We're not going to be able to force people into those different locations. But I will share this with you. Uh, I have a, my, my, my cousin who just passed away, a uh, member of Menza, spoke three languages, trust fund baby. I'm not. Uh, he had bipolar disorder. And so he self medicated with methamphetamines mm -hmm. and heroin. I've seen him as a kid. And we did everything we possibly could as a family to bring him in, get rehabilitation, get mental health, get him housing, do everything we could. And it came down to this. I want you to think about what I'm going to say next. How can I will somebody to want what I want for them? How can I will somebody to want what they should want for themselves? And it's very difficult to get to that, that point. But I'll tell you what, we are committed, as uh, the chief said, being down 875 officers, to have our whole teams back. It's not going to happen anytime soon. 875 okay. officers, let's just say it's 800. That's that's 400 patrol cars. That's 400 patrol cars that, that aren't there. So this starts success. The conversation starts success. And I wish I could tell you one thing that you need to do to be able to help somebody get into those services. All that one thing is today. But I will share with you, please utilize 311, utilize 211 so we can build work with the council district no matter what, to, to help address, because I can't control sanitation. 
CD4 does. I can't control the outreach providers. The mayor's office does. We can give direction and thoughts. But the end result is this. We have to collectively work together. And this is, again, this is a travesty to have somebody 35, 36 years old out there who's homeless, who has bipolar disorder, they need help. And this mayor has brought the family together, the county, the state, the city family together to have that conversation of what we've done wrong and what we can do better. So uh, I share with you, uh, usually I like to joke around a lot, uh, I, but I can't because we, we collectively here, we don't sleep well at night because maybe we think we could do better. And I'll tell you this, we can't. We can't. Just putting somebody in jail is not going to make a difference. Some cases it is, but people who experience homeless with mental health, substance abuse issues, uh, we need a little bit more than that. So I thank you. I hope next time we can do this, I would love to have the whole city family up here. Sanitation, the council district, the mayor's office, Department of Transportation, Department of Mental Health, Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority up here as a panel to answer questions about what we can do and what that process looks like. Uh, because the more we educate ourselves, the more we understand, the better we're gonna be. So I thank you for your time. I love you all. Great guy. There's a lot of work. We're we're very honored to have you in our community. Thank you. So here's what here's what we do just to remind y'all. Um I'm gonna call on you if you're here, stand up. You, you're gonna ask your question. Okay. Once you ask your question, please sit down. That, you know, once once the chief gives his response. It doesn't give you an opportunity to argue with him or to ask another question. One question, that's it. The question that you submitted, that's awesome. We'll get through these questions. And then if any, if we have time, if the chief is, is cool, um, we'll go ahead and, and take other questions from the audience who didn't submit them beforehand. Also, um, you know, what, what they're talking about volunteering, if you guys, if you're on your block, if you do not have a neighborhood watch, talk to your senior lead officers. Yeah. Know your neighbors. If you don't, if you don't have it on your on your block, do it. My my particular block, we were having some issues years ago, and we got had a very very active uh, neighborhood watch going. It was multiple blocks, and it cut crime down a lot. So you know, again, that that's you guys helping these guys uh, keep our keep our uh, city straight. Um, Mark Poloi, 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 are you? Sorry about that. You want to stand up and ask your question? Uh, you got it written down. I don't. Okay, what response? What response? You're you're talking to him, not me. No problem. Okay, what response time should be expected for a burglary nine one one call? It's kind of a multi question. Does video monitoring provide uh, deterrence or increase the likelihood that suspects are identified? So um, there are different tiers of response. So if you have someone in a residence and it's being burglarized right now, we call that a hot prowl. So that's the equivalent of um, a, a top tier emergency because we don't know if that's going to go violent or not. So you're going you're looking at about a six to seven minute response, six or seven minute response time in the San Fernando Valley. Now, some of us in Sherman Oaks live up in the hills, so I am not going to give you that you know six or seven minutes if you're up off Mulholland. It might be a little bit more, but here's the thing: we have cars that are assigned down here. If that car is down here. They're going to get up there pretty quick because they're typically going to know the area. Um, let's say someone's being, uh, their house is being burglarized, but there's, there isn't necessarily anyone there. Um, that's still going to be a high priority call because that's a burglary in progress, but we may not get there within six or seven minutes. If a house has just been burglarized and the suspects are no longer there, that is about a 25 minute response time. We call that code two high or code two. And um, since there's no threat to life and it's property only, that's going to be a slightly more delayed response because the seven units that have the 240,000 people in Van Nuys Division are focusing on saving lives. And then we move down to serious property crimes. Um, I don't, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't want to say that if someone is just came back. So let's, you went on vacation. And now you come back and you determine, oh my God, we were broken into and there's been a burglary. And now we need a report for insurance purposes. Okay, that is going to be probably more than an hour of response time, depending on when you call that in. And it may, the report may even be handled by someone on the next shift, depending on where we are and how busy we are at that particular moment. 
we endeavor to get someone there within the hour. Typically, we we try to, but um, we are not always able to do that. Does that kind of cover the that part of it? Yeah. And the second part? Yeah. We'll go to some. Else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the video video is always good i mean i don't if you're just wondering whether video is a plus or a minus video is always a plus it may not be a plus for you but let's say someone's going to different doors and they hit the door the house next door but they came to your door too and we have you on video that's all we need we have video we're pretty good at solving these things folks and i'm not going to get into our methods and techniques but if we have a picture of someone we do pretty good if he told you, you'd have to. You know. Well, yeah. Yeah. Jody? Um, what is the priority for solving crime? There have been several burglaries in the area, including one where they were tracking the guys on a safe that was vacant, and they have, they actually have the location of the safe. Mm -hmm. They still haven't gone to the house to do the safe. How long ago was that? Uh, it was, uh, <coughs> okay. So um, I, I will say this, in terms of a property crime, we still endeavor to solve these crimes and recover the property. Uh, in, in an event where something uh, may be getting tracked or something like that, there's a possibility that we may know where that item is. We may have it under surveillance. We may be waiting for someone to come back and pick it up. So there are a lot of different possibilities. Um, Typically, if we become aware of where something is actually located, eventually we will recover it. But I just, without knowing the status of the investigation, I can't tell you specifically for that particular one. Quite often though, we become aware of information through our uh, investigative methods um, on who suspects are, on where they've been, on what they're driving, on who they're working with. And we investigate those things. It includes surveillance. It includes technical surveillance. It includes an analysis of their technology. Um, it includes uh, visual observation. It includes what the neighbors see. So a lot of different pieces go into this. Um, right now in the city, we're at about a 12% salt rate on burglaries. We like being around 15%, which is actually really good, by the way, because nationally, you're looking at single digits. But LAPD is pretty good at um, identifying residential and commercial burglaries. Uh, does that kind of answer? Now, as far as what happens with the safe, um, we'll get back to you on that. Did, did that happen here in Sherman Oaks? Oh, okay. So, uh, yes. Doing <laughs> home for the search <laughs> so, Marla's over there like, oh, that's Brian's problem. <laughs> We will look into that and find out. All right. Is uh, Mary Jo, Mary Jo Marino here? No. Okay. We're going we're gonna to pass. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Hi. Um, you have to stand up. Chief? Oh. I'm kidding. He's helping out. Chief Hamilton, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Um, we, you spoke a lot about our slows, our senior lead officers, and um, would you define for us their routine, their uh, duties with response to uh, people who call in, people who are having an incident? I don't think we have a really good idea of how much, uh, in what ways they're available to mm -hmm. us, how we reach them. Um, and what the method is in terms of their duties and, and being hands-on when things are, have either happened or are happening. That's what we I, I have a solution for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while, while they're coming up, though, mm -hmm. uh, come on up. Jose, yeah. you see. Yeah, so I, I'll just tell you that these, these two are the lifeblood of your contact with the department. Okay. Um, you really should for anything non-emergency emergency call 911 anything non-emergency you really should be going through them especially for persistent community problems because they're the only ones that have time to actually work on those problems through the other office How do we contact them? Gonna... yeah we're going to go over that too so so this is this is the 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 way um the communication kind of works on our department a certain set number of officers will work their basic car. They each have a basic car. And what they tell their officers to do gets done. Because if it doesn't get done, then Marla goes to the watch commander and says, hey, how come you're not being responsible to the slows? 
Or someone comes to me and I say, um, hey, fix that. Probably not in that language, but that's what I would say. You guys are right. Thank you. Um, Nancy, I know I have several emails from you. Um, our the senior officers, we were, we're seven senior, senior officers in Van Nuys. Um, we work 40 hours. We don't work uh, once we're off. Normally, our, our is day shift hours. So once we're off, we don't respond to phone calls or emails. Normally, we have an uh, email response that we're out of office or we're not here uh, for maybe two, three days. A lot of people will don't get uh, leave a voice message or uh, email. We'll get back to you in two to three days when we come back. Uh, uh, our response: people are calling our phone numbers for non-emergency calls, or they see us homeless there now. We're not responding to those. Uh, we're not. We're not patrol directly to those calls. You need to call the eight seven seven number or non-emergency or our emergency line. When there's something a crime in progress, the slows are not your contact for responding to calls. Uh, we're more of after the fact, um, long term issues, extra patrol, uh, extra patrol uh, locations, and we communicate that with our like, like he said, our basic car and and go from that. So I know it's tough. Uh, but we are we are trying when there's our patrols sometimes are very short and we do go out and and do ourselves and respond to radio calls and and if there's something nearby when we're doing it if we're not busy we do respond to those to call but for the most part we're always tied up with other community events it's like neighborhood watch meetings yes sir okay and you wanted is direct contact information no, I, I had a, a question oh. related. Okay. okay. Can I have a, can I, can I, can I, you guys don't want to go to your house because you're having a situation like this. You know, we don't have to be able to go to the house. So, try out my people. They might be here. 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 Uh, online. 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 Did you have a question having to do with the slows? No, I got it. I you got it? it? Okay. Question. Having to do with the slows? With the what? The senior leads? No, it was oh. addressed at the. Uh, okay, hold on one second then. Anything else with you guys? I just uh, on the homeless issue, I don't ask you had a lot of issues on that and the homeless issues. A lot of those homeless issues it needs to be directed to the city council. Uh, I know there's a crime that happened a few days ago, and we will the detectives will follow up, and that just is a process yeah. on that and that thing. But when anything that is ongoing, we'll, we'll try to do the outreach. But in most of the other homeless that you're seeing out there right now, it's directed to the city council. Don't, don't forget, for misdemeanors not committed in our presence, you know that's a different situation. Just one now. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. And gal. Can I answer that part oh. of the question? So make sure. Okay. We have one more uh free uh Susan. And then we'll go to go to the uh, mm -hmm. folks' questions. And again, if you got if you guys are leaving, please throw away your garbage, otherwise Jules will be here all night. <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you at another fifty one time and I, I comment that I know nice with that because that no one knows you. So thank you Absolutely. for being here and, and I think you know um my question is this it seems like the policies that are currently in place really hinder the police department from being able to assist them. Are there specific policies that you know of that are helping law enforcement rather than hindering them? And what is the department doing to support and motivate officers to be proactive in trying to track them? Well, so I remind people of this all the time. We're still the LAPD. So we, I, I know you hear a lot of things in social media, mainstream media. Um, I think what you can what you're seeing now is we're being more selective and targeted in terms of what kind of enforcement we're doing. Um, obviously, as with any organization, when you are, uh, you know, when you have a, de de I, I don't want to say your resources are necessarily diminished, but when you have fewer resources, you have to prioritize. So for instance, right now, we're looking at ways to bring back some element of the previous hope detail. 
because we, we see the road ahead and we see that the department will have a role, but we will not have the primary role of helping the mayor solve this vexing homelessness issue. But he cannot do it alone. <laughs> he and his four people cannot do it for the entire city of Los Angeles and four million people. So we prioritize resources. Um, we will eventually move some people back into that field, but don't forget every time we move people out of that, into that field, we're taking them from somewhere else. In terms of proactivity, um, I can tell you right, I, I, I get stories all the time of things going on here in the Valley. Random traffic stop in Florida division last night, five pounds of methamphetamine recovered during the officer's investigation. You see on the news, people are going in pursuit all the time out here in, in black and whites. Every single one of those are initiated by the officers doing observation work and being proactive, trying to remove criminals from the community before they commit more crime. So these things continue to happen. Our arrests are only down 2%. And don't forget, that's with 800 fewer officers over the last two years in a pandemic environment. So we're still doing the work out there. Um, in terms of what happens with filing, I always try to explain to people, we do not have control over the filing process. That is the district attorney's office and the city attorney's office. Regardless of what policies they have, the LAPD will always present a thorough and complete and lawful investigation for filing consideration. The filing determination are made by those entities and the federal government. So they're made by those entities. If they come back to us, they say, we need more work done, we do the work. Because our job, and we're the only ones that have this job, is to make your community safer. So yeah. we, we uh, he's very thorough. So it takes his time on answering the questions. Really, really appreciate it. Because of the time, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Anyone, you, you have a question? Anyone else have a question? Okay. So we'll take two questions and maybe the chief will answer. Yeah, yours. Yeah. Um, in the last, I've lived here about seven years. Mm -hmm. with an old, and never had a burglary that I knew of. Within the last uh, two months, we've had five mm -hmm. within a half a mile of my house. So this, and both of them, I think, involved a white van. Uh, I was actually woken up at three in the morning and I went down, uh, a brand new neighbor moved in and they were just redoing their house so they had all their uh, appliances out. So I went down at three o'clock in the morning, but they called me, they didn't know anyone else. Mm -hmm. to see was there and I shined my lights on my arm. The police were there within five minutes of the time I got there. So I'm kind of motivated. How do you set up a, <clears throat> and I walk my dog all the time, so everybody mm -hmm. knows who I am. Sure. So I, how do you set up a neighborhood watch type of system? Because it's, it seems to be a, a, a group that's just talking our neighborhood for this period of time. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's the same group all the time. Give me an intersection where you live. I live on uh, uh, I live on Royal Meadow Place, uh -huh. which is right off of uh, the Ridge Royal Ridge. You know Royal Woods. Yep, Royal Woods right up, up in the up in the uh, up in the Ridge area. There's your contact right there. See Jose after the meeting. Yep, you? got your cover. See you. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Man in the back. Yes, um, I just wanted to thank all the officers for all that you do for us. They, they do the hard work, not us. They don't let us out in the field anymore because they know that would enter. Yeah, so. Billy works hard. Oh, Billy works hard. Oh, they work hard. Mariana works hard. You, me, me not so much. Oh, you're the chief. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Everybody, make sure you come next time. We've got a great speaker. You'll really enjoy this person. Please.